Yeah. <laughs> All right, so we are going to start. Thanks, Louis. Yeah. I hand over to you. Hello, um, I'm Louis, and we're talking about optimizing a AAA with and Python on desktop. And I'm a dev tech engineer at AMD, so my job is basically to support the game developers that their game runs as optimal as possible on our hardware. So, and I'm also joining our driver does what supports to do. So, one side fixing the other side, but also fixing the other side, and kind of being in the middle. And as part of this job, I work doing the last few months on the World Plan title. And this is what my talk is about, just to first, um, tell you a bit about my experiences I've done, what kind of optimization did work my work for this title, and maybe just um, a bit of what yeah, we've learned from this process and what maybe we can apply to this. So um, unfortunately, I'm not allowed to tell you what title this was. Um, so you kind of just have to believe me. But what I can tell you is that the first Vulcan game title um, running with this engine. Um, there was a DirectX 11 version of this engine. There was also an interface of DirectX 12. Um, and then the game developers ported the engine to support Vulcan. And once um, the Vulcan version was, was somewhat stable, we started to look in, in um, optimizing the game, and that's what uh, that's um, what the talk will be about um, about the optimizing. So when optimizing a game, um, usually you can do like two things, kind of in parallel. One is um, like following the best practices. Hopefully, these um, just require minor transformation. It's not always the case, but more or less. And then um, also other optimization opportunities, which usually require a bit of more engine restructuring and a bit more work. And you should start this um, early enough because it takes you here quite a lot of time. You can also break some things and you get like new problems. So these both things have to go kind of hand in hand. So best practices, what are these? Um, this is not complete at all. But um, this is kind of based on what kind of um, was important for this particular game. So one thing is this is compression enabled, especially for the key buffer render targets. Then how about the barriers? Are they kind of like in the second state? Can we make use of the copy queue? How about shader building infrastructure? And then like the usual stuff like, do we, do we have like the curriculum usage flags, um, code layouts, and so on. And yes, this is kind of a checklist. As I said, it's not complete, but then you can follow this through for your own game, for example. And then uh, about other optimization uh, opportunities. Um, this is obviously very engine specific. For this engine and for this game, there was a uh, great async com compute opportunity. So um, what it basically is about is that if you have two frames, so frame one and frame two, um, you could overlap the beginning of the frame with the, um, the end of the frame with the beginning of the next frame. So basically do something like this. So if this is the post process, then you can overlap it with the pre process of the next frame, um, but then still present on the graphics skew. And what's Wolfen specific, you can also present on compute queue. You can do this. But if you do this, I recommend that you still have this part as a fallback in your engine just because of tooling, because not many games do this kind of stuff. So it can break tooling, but you definitely can do this. So, and you see it's kind of like, yeah, you have to switch back and stuff. And you know, just just um, yeah, so what I'm going to um, talk about in detail when we start is compression. And to be more precise about ECC, that the color compression is the technique we use in our hardware. Other vendors have their own compression techniques, um, but in this talk, I will obviously just cover ECC. Then about barriers, what we did for this engine and for this game to um, optimize them, a bit about other synchronization issues and problems, and then other smart things. So but let's start with the ECC. Ah oh, yeah, and this is like the checklist I've mentioned before. And I also won't forget async compute. So this will be also pop up during the talk. So yeah, but let's start with ECC. So ECC is data color compression. I will talk about a bit what it exactly is, then why do we want it, why should we care about it, what's the performance impact um, for this particular game, and how do we enable ECC. So this is like the most interesting question. So, but what is DCC? Well, DCC stands for data color compression. Um, 
it's for polar targets, that's why polar compression. And it takes advantage of the fact that when they're targets, you have slow varying data. So if you look at a blue sky, um, while most of it's in blue, and there's like little variance between them. Another example is if you look at this picture, it's mostly beige. Kind of fascinating, even the fourth the raccoon is also kind of in the like the color of its surroundings. So you see it's like little variance between the neighboring pixels. And you see basically takes advantage of this. <coughs> so on a hey, very high level detail, what it does, it stores wall blocks. And one value is stored in Kohlbuschissen, and all the other values are stored in deltas, like as delta. And not a point thing, it's lossless. So if you enable DLC, you don't lose any of the image quality. Um, yeah, so kind of like um, <coughs> I want to enable it. And why? Because it saves bandwidth, basically. So if you do a lot of writing and reading, you save it. And um, like experience showed that it's very beneficial for G-buffer render targets. It can be also beneficial for other resources, obviously, but if you have to pick a few one, then I would recommend you first look at the G-buffer render targets because just experience showed that they usually benefit a lot from these bandwidth savings. So how much? Well, for this game title, um, you observed speed ups on all tested AMD cards, ranging between 5 to 10%. But of course, it really varies. Um, it depends on the workload. It also depends between the purpose card. But for this game type, it was quite beneficial. So it was really a nice gain to get this in enabled. So um, this should be quite convincing, right? So let's talk about how we get DCC enabled. And unfortunately, there's not just a, like a setting you can set all DCC enabled, because um, the driver will enable it automatically if it's safe to do so. So as developers, we have to kind of ensure that it's safe to do so, and it depends on a number of different factors. So the first step is that you should just check if the is maybe already enabled, because if it's already enabled, you don't have to do anything anymore, right? And to check this, you can use RGP, this is the RGP profiler, um, take a capture, then you go to the overview tab, and the sub tab when the left targets, then you will see a list of all the um, when the left targets in your game. And there's also a column um, that says compression, and then you can check if it's on and off. And for this case, these are the cheaper for render times for this game. And when I checked, it was off. So this was quite sad. And the question is, um, why is it off? And how can we um, figure out um, this? So the first step is you can just stay in this um, view using RPP and have a look at the formats. Um, DC is possible for float and integer formats. Um, I can't give you a complete list, this would be like too much here, but in general, all the common formats are supported. So for this case, like RGB, A, A, S, RGB, or you know those are support, uh, supported, so the formats here are not a problem. Um, okay, so formats not a problem, what to do next? Um, you should have a closer look in the resource. To do this, you can take either your surrender log, and go to resource inspector and then just click on the resource in question. Or obviously you can also just look in your source code. So render that you see um, the create info structure from the image, and then you can check the format. As I've just said, it's fine in this case. Um, also the usage flags are fine. So in this case, it's the transfer usage bits, the sample bit, and the color attachment bits all work with DCC. So these are not a problem. Sharing mode is sharing mode exclusive. This is also fine. What's not that fine is um, the image create moodle format bit. Why? Because it disables DCC. Um, why does it disable DCC? Well, when I talked about um, format support, um, I wasn't very precise because DCC only works for float, exclusive, or integer formats. So if you only have one format, that's kind of given, right? If I have a float format, it's supported. If I have an integer format, it's supported. And how does the driver know the format of the image? Well, it just looks at the image grade infrastructure. There you provide the format, and everything is fine. But what happens now if we have the Moodle bit set? Well, let's look at the spec of the Moodle bit. It says that we can have an image view with a different format. So this basically makes it impossible for the driver to rely on the format information from the grade infrastructure. And, but this is important because the, the driver kind of needs to distinguish between those formats. <coughs> the driver needs to know if it's an integer and flow format use, because in this case, DCC has to be disabled 
If there's maybe a format used which is not supported by DCC at all, then it has to be disabled as well. Or if um, you only use float formats, then this is enabled, can be enabled, or if you only use integer formats, this is the same. And I think we're looking at the Moodle bit, the firmware has no idea um, which of the following cases we have. So we kind of need to provide the driver with additional information to make the smart decision here. Because if you just have the immutable bit, the driver has to play safe and just disable the DCC. Even though in theory it would be possible, but the driver just has to be safe in this case. So how can we provide the driver with more information? Well, luckily there's this extension, it's the PHR image format list, and here we can give the driver a list of all the image formats which have to be supported by the image. And based on this list, the driver can make a smarter decision. So how can we use this list? Well, we just provide the number of formats and then the list of formats, and the structure is passed to the next pointer from the image create infrastructure, and then the driver can make, based on this list, the best decision. And the um, game that did this, so in this case, for the G buffering attacks, we have two formats. One is unorm, and the other one is actually this RGB and both are integer formats, so this is um, fine for DCC and DCC can be enabled. But let's check in up to field if um, this is really was enabled, and when I did this, um, sadly it was still off, so I was kind of, okay, what's, what's the problem now? So let's go back to another and um, check what was wrong. And, well, format is fine, format's fine, user spec is also fine, but the sharing mode changed from exclusive to concurrent. Why did it suddenly change? Well, during the weeks when the developers um, added this, they also added async compute support, actually. And as a side effect, now all resources had as default the sharing mode. And it was, um, yeah, this was kind of like, well, because um, sharing mode concurrent actually um, disables DCC. And what does um, sharing mode concurrent do? Well, it's um, make it possible to access the resource from different queue families. And this is just a property which is not supported um, by our hardware, so it would be quite of, like, a difficult to enable DCC, so it's just disabled, basically. And, yeah. So, now in all our resources in the game, this is even disabled as a side effect to async compute support. Another note of for, um, Async compute support on this. Um, they actually did what I mentioned in the beginning of the talk. So they overlapped the, the post processing step from the frame with the pre processing step of the next frame. And this change actually gave a speed up of about 10%, also depending on profit card, of course. But overall, it was quite a success, I would say, to add this async compute support. So it generally was a good thing. But because of this, we still had no idea about the effect of DCC on the cheaper foreign targets because at this point, um, it was always disabled DCC. So, but let's keep trying and try to get DCC on, right? So, um, for this, we had to kind of switch back to exclusive. And if you have resource which is only accessed by one Q family, you can just safely switch back um, because the component is just not needed. But um, interesting are the resources which are actually accessed by several queues. So which are accessed by the graphics queue family and by the compute queue family. Um, because in this case, we have to do with, um, trans transfer the queue family ownership. And how to do this? Well, it's done in two steps. First, you have to release the um, ownership from the source, the queue family. And then um, after it's released, you have to acquire it from the destination queue family. And this releasing and acquiring is done um, via barriers. So um, let's just step to a small example. So an example, Q family zero holds the current um, ownership of image A, and Q family one wants to acquire it. So first, um, Q family zero has to release it. So it has to issue a barrier, and source family, source Q family has to set to zero, and the destination Q family has to set to one. This barrier has to be issued um, in a command buffer which is associated to command pool, which is associated to Q family zero, basically, and then um, we have to submit it. And here with the um, submission, we have to also um, 
is similar to sync and cross-secure, just to be sure that the releasing really happens before the acquiring. And then um, the acquiring happens on the destination queue family, in our example, and so on. And once we've done this and have like handled this um, queue family ownership correctly, we can safely switch back to um, sharing mode exclusive. And once the, um, the robot did this, I checked RGP again, and luckily, finally, this key was enabled. And this was quite more. And then you also could um, check for the performance difference. And yes, I mentioned this already in the beginning of the usage of the, um, you could see between 5 to 10%, depending on AMD Focus Cloud. So this was another quite nice um, performance to have. One last thing um, you may have noticed. One cheaper was still DCC off. So why? Let's check again the render doc. And yes, format is still fine. Um, share mode exclusive, you can see it here. It's changed now back from concurrent. And but now we have here the storage space for this um, specific cheaper file render target. So it's just the source number two. I call it here. And why did I add the storage bit? But it's also related to the async queue change because um, they moved all the post-processing from um, the graphics queue to the compute queue. So what was before a full screen fragment shader pass and was now a compute shader pass. And this made it um, required that this resource number two from Chibuffer had to have now the storage bit. And um, why? Well, the storage bit um, specifies that um, the resource can be used as a descriptor type storage image, which is which supports load, store, and atomic operations. And important is here the store, because um, before we had a fragment shader, and then in this fragment shader, the cheaper for source number two was just used as a color attachment. And when it was changed to compute shader, it was now a storage image, and the storage image had to um, support store operations. So we now needed this um, storage image bit. This is totally fine in this example, because we needed this bit. But as a side effect, um, this is because this error because it's not um, the storage bit is um, It's just a great reminder that you should always use the user storage bit you really need. Um, as I said, in this example, it was totally fine because we needed it. But if you would have set it by default for all cheap buffer resources, for example, then you still would have like this is the this error on all cheap buffer resources. Another sample um, usage flag which influences this is the sample bit makes CCC less efficient because um, if the resource is only written to but never read, we can um, make some additional optimizations in the compression technique. And But if you have the sample bit, we have to assume that we also read at some point the resource, so compression will be less efficient. Um, yeah, so just keep in mind, always use what you need, but not more. To wrap this up about DCC, <coughs> Enabled. Um, if you use the great um, mutable format bit, it's only fine, but I always recommend to also use the image format list. And sharing mode exclusive, um, you can use sharing mode concurrent for like first versions of async compute, that's totally fine. It um, makes it easier to not deal with the additional burden of several queue families and stuff, but I don't recommend it to use it in production ready code um, for that. I would want to still use um, share mode exclusive and just transfer the queue from your ship. Um, it's usually uh, more performant than having the concurrent sharing mode. And user fed, yes. That all the user fed you need, but no. Then other smaller things concerning DCC, um, DCC is not only about an ailment, it's also about decompression. Um, sometimes decompression happens, for example, during transfer operations, you can have a decompress. Also, if you set the general layout and this is, um, for example, if you have a case that you only read the resource, but um, you don't set the shader read only bit, but uh, shader read only layer, but also but the general layer, then you have a decompression, and that's actually what here happened. Um, the resource was just read, but they still set the general layout, and then we have a decompression, which took up a certain amount of time of this whole um, pass, even though it wasn't needed. And then dev targets, dev targets gets also compressed, but not DCC compressed. It's a different compression technique. It has different rules, and everything I told you about does not apply to dev targets. 
even though it's in the same column in RGP, um, I just meant that you don't get confused. Because, um, for example, if you have for all the resources sharing one concurrent, we still see that dev tags are compressed and just don't get and then just kind of like a warning, because there's no rule without exception, right? Um, sometimes they are tweaked in the driver for special cards. So um, something can happen, you follow all the guidelines, and then C could be still disabled, or something different happens. Just don't be confused by this. Um, in general, you will be fine, because it's really just exceptions, but just be aware of it. That sometimes you may observe different behavior than this way. Yeah, but that's all about DCC. Now let's go to synchronization. And in particular about barriers, it's about placing them as smartly as possible, batching consecutive barriers, and also a bit about piping stage mask. We heard about this in the beginning, like the first talk, talked a lot about this, so I will just talk really briefly about it, and then also presentation. So um, barriers. Most of the stuff I talk <coughs> today is basically just the experience we, I've made with this um, engine and the issues we have with the barriers most likely had the roots in the original engine structure, which is DIX11 based, and DIX11 does not have barriers. And then um, how we solved this issue was just by rearranging barriers, batching them, and then some other findings, which is um, related to the pipeline stage mass. So, but how did the original engine setup work? Well, um, the winning work was watching all nice in components. Let's say there was like shadow map component, lighting component, um, dynamic models component, and so on. And each component had uh, constants. So in these constants, um, the information was got already in the beginning of the frame. So when we started to um, like record all those commands, and we already knew the, component, uh, the constants associated with and then let's go through an example that you understand like how it worked in the engine. So you have the constant information already in the beginning of the frame. Then constants A, B, and C are actually equal. And constants D is in this example different. Um, so most of the constants, yeah, they didn't vary between the components, just a few were different. And here in this example, A and B is in, uh, independent. C depends on A and B, and component D depends on component C. And if you lay out the frame map, how they rendered it, um, what they did was that they updated the constants right before the associated component. So what we had, we have a barrier to um, make the um, correct layout transition for the um, constants buffer. Then the update happened. Then we had another barrier to ensure that the update was done. Then we had the component or the straw commands. And then we had the next update constant for component B, and so on. So you see the work was very sequential. Even though between A and B is actually not a dependency, but because of this updating the, con the constants, we had like this artificial separation between these components. So how can we make this better? Well, the first step is just to rearrange. So just um, place all the constants in the beginning of the frame, because we already have the information. So just do first update constants A, B, C, D, and then after this, um, do all this other work. And in this case, these will overlap because now we don't have a barrier between them anymore. And then we can do some further optimizations is by actually batching these barriers and let the updating con like update constants overlap because they also don't depend on each other. And because these three are actually equal, we don't have to create redundant copies. We can just update it once and just let the components refer to the same location, so we reduce the number of updates. Um, what we ended up with in the engine was actually just this step, so we just rearranged it just because of time constraints. Um, we also have like the updating just sequential and then all the straw commands, but this already showed the significant speed up. So um, what we had before, this was, um, these are the G-buffers. So you see there's a like, lot of holes because of these updating the constants. And when we rearranged them, we got rid of the holes, basically, and we also got a bit more overlap between other render um, targets, but also in between the cores. And you see it in this view better, so you see the occupancy got higher 
just because they had more overlap, there's more work for the GPU to process, and we didn't like train the GPU because of these um, barriers for the constant updates. And for the T buffer parts, we have could have sort of speed of about 15%, 10, 15%, depending on the scene. And this was quite nice, just by rearranging the barriers and placing them in the front of the. Um, um, yeah. There's another thing we did for barriers, like using more batching consecutive barriers. So in early builds, we had like 10 or even more barriers right behind each other. And this is not necessary. You can just issue one pipeline barrier, um, including all the layout transfers. And you can do this because in common pipeline barrier, you can like specify the number of all these barriers and then just define the list. So if you have an example, for example, you have two image layer transfers. Um, the knife is just for each image layer tran transition, you can issue a separate common pipeline barrier. Or um, what's the better way is you just create a list of all your image layers and then submit it in one row with one pipeline barrier. And this also saves a bit of time because you don't have the overhead, overhead of committing all the separate domain pipeline barriers. Um, yeah, pipeline stage mask. We heard about it already in the beginning of today. So it's just if you have like dependencies here, you don't need to wait until the bottom and overlap them. What I want to talk in specific is um, the all commands bit. So the all commands bit um, is equivalent to the logical or every other pipeline stage back to support on the queue. And I want to specifically talk about the all commands bit on the compute pipeline. Because here from the compute pipeline, it includes the transfer stage bit, the compute share stage bit, and also the bottom. Stage bit. And the bottom stage bit um, should not be ignored because it adds actually an end of pipe timestamp. And this can take up to 64K cycles on the async queue. So, so I recommend uh, not using all commands bit, just use the, the specific pipeline stage mask you really need. So, for example, use um, state compute data bit or stage transfer bit. And you will save a um, considerable amount of time. So, for example, first we had. Um, the all commands bit, so it took like 0 0.044, it's like synchronization is full. And then when we change this to a um, compute shader and transfer bit, um, it's very less. So in this like, small change, made like huge improvement for the async compute passes because before we had a lot of idle time just for these barriers. And with this change, um, yeah, we got rid of them. Yeah, this, um, right, this was all about barriers, now a bit about post queues on colonization. Um, before we had AC compute, um, we didn't have to deal with it. So the engine just had about seven command buffers per frame. Um, when AC compute support was added, the amount doubled. And this is, was due because of synchronization, because at each sync point, we actually had to like submit the command buffer and issue a new one. So you can see the change here. Now we have all this semaphores and stuff. And it's not optimal how they handled it. Um, they also submitted sometimes empty command papers just for the sake of synchronization. Um, there would have been a way to get around this, but it was just not feasible in the time frame because it was async was added, then had all the like deal with the other stuff, and then also deal with empty command papers was just too much. And so short for release, but um, that's how they ended up with just like not optimal, but it was okay. And it's just like the kind of observation we've done during the process. That this post through synchronization was like, yeah, okay, we had like some like ugly command buffers and empty stuff to deal with. And here, like a lot of small command buffers as well, but it's just, yeah, a side effect. Yeah, um, yeah quick summary. Um, check the barriers. Can we rearrange them? Do we really need to submit the barrier right before we need it, or can we maybe move them to an earlier stage? Um, you can batch them if they're consecutive. Um, specify the stage mass as precise as possible. You can really save a considerable amount of time. And yeah, cost of simulation is only process of mission to boundaries. Yeah, and then now just other small things. It's really just more, I won't talk too much about it. Um, it's about the copy queue, then a bit about the compute chain and compute and swap chain I talked about in the beginning, and then a bit about chain everything. 
go to copy queue. Um, copy queue is if you want to yeah, copy basically from the TPU to CPU. If you want to do TPU or TPU copies, I wouldn't recommend it. So it's better if you want to do copies which are not time critical. And for this game, there was such a case. So there was a resource we just need to copy from the TPU to the CPU. It was not time critical, like the resource was needed in the first half of the frame at all, so we had like plenty of time to do it. And before they just did it on a graphics screen, it was like blocking the whole TPU for about on a 2% frame time. And then, then we switched it to the copy queue. Here you can see this. And basically saved this one or 2% back. And <coughs> it was the sync point. Yeah, it wasn't completely free because we had to sync. But it was still way less time than we spent for doing this copy on the GPU. Of course, doing this copy, nothing else could be done doing on the GPU. Um, yeah, then about compute queue and swap chain. <coughs> I talked about it in the beginning already. Um, on Vulkan, you can directly draw from the compute queue to the swap chain. Um, here, they, they didn't do it actually on the engine because they, it needed to be like also work on other versions, so not only on Vulkan PC, but also on consoles and stuff. So that's why they had like this copy. So basically, they used the intermediate texture for the compute traders, and then they copied this result to the swap chain on the graphics queue. And this is basically, this is the whole UI. And you see this copy is taking about one third of the UI computation. So um, in Vulkan, actually, this is not needed. So you can just skip this and just draw and render directly to the swap chain <coughs> queue. And yeah, you could basically also present from the compute queue, but as I said, I would always have this path as a format as well, just because of tooling. And this is the last topic, it's about the shader building infrastructure. So in this game, um, they used HLSL shader code, and they had all those shaders already in HLSL, like not feasible at all to rewrite them in GLSL, and I wouldn't recommend that either. And in the beginning, they had the GLSLang validator, but then they switched to the DirectX compiler, and it's also what I did, what we basically would recommend because um, this path, like SphereV generated using this path, is um, still we call it our shader compiler sees the most. It's the most common path. And this also means it's um, the most optimized path. So um, SphereV generated by the DirectX compiler from the HLSL um, is the, yeah, the most optimized version. Um, yeah. So that's basically it. Just as a reminder, um, check for compression, especially for cheaper for render targets. And um, if you have to pick certain resources, then have a look at your barriers. Um, these are really important for performance. Um, is there a possibility to use the copy queue? Um, yeah, on Vulkan, you can directly ren render to the software from the compute queue. And please use the Linux compiler and quite to share some And yeah, thanks to these amazing people. It's also possible. Also, thanks a lot to the game devs. Um, unfortunately, I can't mention them, but thanks to them a lot. And if you want to read additional information, you can look up. And yeah, now if you have any questions, please ask now or write me an email, send me a Linux message, or ask me later. Uh, I have a question about uh, is, this, is it possible to add an extension where you could say, here's an image create info, will this have DCC? Um, I think this is possible, it's just I'm not sure if we would want this, but probably not, because we don't really like using like a lot of extensions and most of them <coughs> never get used. But if there's demand for it, we do it. Yeah, but right now I don't see it, yeah.
Yeah, because I've seen cases on this, this is like very Polaris specific, but I've seen a use concurrent where I render an image and I use it shader read only in the compute queue right mm -hmm. afterwards, but I seem to get ECC anyways. Yeah. Uh, that's a bit confusing. It, it, are there some rules where concurrent can still have DCC on a driver? I, I think concurrent mostly breaks if you look concurrent with the transfer queue. I think there are cases where you need concurrent on the compute queue that it will still be active. I'm not sure what those yeah, are. Yeah, I think if you have the concurrent mode, by default it's just disabled because basically the driver doesn't really know how to use, how will you use the resource, even though it would be possible in theory. Yeah, um, so. yeah, to clarify, because when you have concurrent, you can specify exactly which families it's yeah. concurrent with, and then I also use only graphics and compute, not mm -hmm. transfer. Yeah, the, the, the main issue for us is that uh, if you are concurrent with the transfer queue, it can't do decompression. So um, you kind of have to stay decompressed at all times in order to be able to use that queue. Um, I think that compute queues can handle most decompression, not all of them. So there are, you know, there are, there are cases you can do you can stay compressed in cases where you can't. Um, I, I haven't looked at the drive to see exactly what they are. In DCC, you said that one of the components is full precision and the others have a less precision. Which component is full precision? Ah, uh, you mean how it's stored? Yeah, usually it's the block, and then one pixel is like stored in, in full position, and the rest is just stored as delta. Right. Okay, that would be in the RGB space. Um, actually, not sure. Is that not going to the YUV or something? No. Yeah. yeah, but basically, you don't lose any information. Okay. So the image quality or anything is not affected by this. Do you have any numbers on the compression ratio in best and worst case scenario? Not really. It highly I think we have some information public yeah, about DCC that has this, but I don't know what it is. Yeah, I don't know. So about the async uh, compute and presenting for the compute queue, I think that's uh, an extremely nice uh, optimization, and I'm a bit surprised to say that uh, to hear that you say that we should do it because of tooling. Yeah, I mean, not many games present on the compute queue right now, so it's not really uh, proven that it works in all cases. I mean, it works for Doom, they do that, and yeah. tooling it, works. It just sounds very terrible to right. sync back to the graphics yeah, queue, yeah. and then the graphics queue, it has to like yeah. sync to, this, uh, to the swap chain, right, where you could leave all that on the computer. Yeah. I think if more games would go on this path, then the tools would also be more robust. Okay. But in this stage, I would still recommend the other path, just for yeah, pretty working stuff. Okay, so it's it's like uh, RTP and, and yeah. render dog, yeah. stuff like that. Right. Okay. Do you also get DCC for uncompressed textures, or this is just render target specific? Do you, do you mean when you're uploading a texture? Yeah. Uh, no, it's only, only sub-generated by rendering as far as I'm aware. I think it's technically possible, but I don't think we have that. Mm -hmm. um, if I were to access a DCC texture, which do you recommend? Which uh, Fragment door, compute door. How do you recommend it to access in the best way? Say if I need to do uh, distortion from a render. I'm not sure if I understand. Like, um, like which? I mean, like if the texture is compressed, it's basically kind of invisible to you. Okay, but um, you the said the data that core can handle okay. compressed data. Yeah, uh, you said there was some flags that. Um, affected the DCC compression. Ah, uh, yeah. So, for example, the, the sample bit mm -hmm. makes it less efficient. Okay. Um, but you still can read compressed data. Okay. It's just not that efficient anymore. Any more questions? Yeah? Uh, is there a difference between uh, shader read 
and input attachments there for uh, VCC performance. Thanks a lot. So now we'll arrange the room five, ten minutes for the panel discussion. So if you want to grab some more food, that tea quickly, five, ten minutes, we are going to be back. Uh, <coughs>